Our webinar today is called Ultrasound Guided Regional Anesthesia for Cardiac Surgery. And our presenter today is Dr. Richard Teams. Dr. Teams is a dedicated anesthesiologist with a unique background in nursing who excels in working with trauma and critical care patients. He trained at the busiest trauma center in the US and has exceptional regional skills and ultrasound technique in multiple nerve block modalities. He is currently the director of regional anesthesia at John Peter Smith Hospital, as well as the national clinical director of regional anesthesia for Envision Physician Services. Dr. Teams is an officer in the United States Army Reserve Medical Corps. His clinical interests include acute pain management, regional anesthesia, advanced airway techniques, and cardiovascular anesthesia. He has a genuine interest and enthusiasm for teaching clinical and acute pain regional anesthesia and is a bilingual English-Spanish patient advocate. Thank you so much for being here today, Dr. Teams. Um, Dr. Teams is coming to us from, from Texas today where they are thawing out from the tundra that hit that state recently. I'm sure you've all heard of that. So really appreciate Dr. Teams taking the effort to, uh, to be with us today. And with that, I'll turn it over to you. Awesome. Well, thank you so much for that. I'm, uh, I'm happy to be here. And yes, we thawed out down here in Texas and, uh, and we were able to, to do this. So we're really excited about it. So we're going to go over some really cool things today, uh, particularly blocks for cardiac anesthesia. Uh, now, I, uh, I do cardiac anesthesia. And so I'm going to talk to you a little bit about the, the things that I do in my own clinical practice um, and, and what's worked for me. We've done a little bit of experimenting when it comes to some of these blocks, and uh, I'll kind of explain to you what, what's worked and what we currently do in clinical practice. And so without further ado, let's go into a couple things here. So I'm gonna to jump to my slides. So for cardiac anesthesia, there's really a few options we have for pain management, right? So we could do PO, IV pain medications. That's kind of been the mainstay for a long time. Uh, thor thoracic epidurals really is not an option for cardiac anesthesia, and we should all pretty much know why. We don't wanna massively heparinize our patients and then give them uh, a, a thoracic epidural and a you know an epidural hematoma that's usually not that's usually frowned upon. Um, in more recent literature, there's uh, ESP blocks, and I run into a lot of colleagues throughout the country who do a lot of ESP blocks with great success for uh, cardiac anesthesia, and that's actually going to be one of the blocks we're going to scan today, and we're going to talk about quite a bit in length, and that's going to be the first block we're going to talk about today. Uh, the second one is doing what I call the modified PEX block. And for those of you who are familiar with doing PEX blocks for, say, uh, breast surgeries or mastectomies or implants or <clears throat> that sort of thing, um, it's, a, it's a takeoff of that. And I'll explain some of the uh, nuances for doing this modified PEX block and why it's, it's worked for us. It's one of the blocks that we currently do. So going to thoracic epidurals, has anybody ever felt like this where, you know, does anybody really want to do a thoracic epidural? Uh, anymore. Um, I mean, you know, a lot of people like doing them. I used to do them a lot when I was uh, early on in my career until we started using some of these other nerve blocks. But, you know, sometimes it's trying to find that roadmap for doing a thoracic epidural. And every once in a while, I felt like I was going to do this. You know, uh, that's generally frowned upon. You don't want to do the through and through technique when you're doing a thoracic epidural. But sometimes I've felt like that, you know. But luckily, there's a lot of better, I don't want to say better, but there's a lot of really great analgesic modalities for nerve blocks out there, particularly these ones, ESP. So we're going to talk about ESP first. So here's kind of the anatomy for it. So obviously the rectus spinae muscles um, are just, uh, you know, go are on the side of the, of the uh, thoracic and lumbar spine there. And there's a couple of muscles that overlie them. So one of them that's viewed there in the middle is going to be the rhomboid. And then on top of that, you have um, the, uh, the trapezius muscle. Um, a lot of people kind of want to focus in on those muscles, but really the crux of this block is identifying properly the transverse process. Um, the erector spinal muscles just live right on top of it. Now, depending on where you are, where, whether you're below the, um, the scapula, you may or may not see the rhomboid muscle, but it doesn't really matter, right? It's just kind of a landmark to know where you're at. I like using the tip of the scapula to kind of know where I'm at uh, for, for this block because it's very dependent on which dermatomes um, that, you're, that you're in. Um, now this kind of shows a little bit of what the spread of that local anesthetic and how it really works. 
uh, where that local anesthetic kind of spreads around and is um, and, and goes kind of in the paravertebral space and gets those uh, spinal nerve roots as they come out and traverse the uh, you know around the ribs. So one one aspect of the rectus spinae that comes up quite a bit is what about the spread of it? And there was actually a really great study that was done here by, um, oh, I can't pronounce his last name, Ad, 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 uh, Adarki, I, I think is how you say it. But in all these, they used um, they used 20 mLs and they did two different types. One was a retrolaminar block, which is pretty, is very similar to rectus spiny block. Um, and then there's the rectus spiny block. And this shows them putting it at T5. And that's what I would recommend doing for any uh, thoracic case. Because if you see it on the blue lines there, the very first one, the big box there on the left, you'll see um, what the spread is. And it pretty much covers all the dermatomes that we're concerned about with when we're talking about cardiac anesthesia. So the main dermatomes for cardiac anesthesia are gonna be obviously your sternotomy, which is gonna be from T2 all the way down to T6, and maybe chest tubes that are sub -xiphoid which might be T7, T8, maybe T9, but generally T7 and T8 are, are, are really where it's gonna be. Um, and then on the, these other ones to the side is where they'll spread the spread of this local anesthetic is. And they used a, these were cadaveric studies where they could look and see that uh, some spread into the epidural space, some spread into the neural foramen, and then obviously spreading more laterally into the intercostal space. Whereas with this, um, retrolaminar block, it, it, it pretty much is fixated there. It doesn't, um, the retrolaminar block uh, stays with inside a fascial plane that doesn't like to spread laterally. Um, and then there's uh, actually some pretty cool studies. These are just kind of highlighting three of them that talk specifically about uh, car ESP for cardiac uh, cases. And all these studies, which have done more uh, pretty recently, have all demonstrated that yes, erector spiny block is actually pretty good. In fact, uh, I believe that first one is, uh, let's see, make sure that's the one. Yeah, so that first one is actually comparing erector spiny block to uh, thoracic epidural, which we know uh, thoracic epidural is the gold standard. And it, it says ESP is a promising alternative to a thoracic epidural in uh, optimal perioperative pain management and cardiac surgery. And in that study, it goes in and says that there really wasn't a lot of difference from a pain management opioid uh, utilization between the two modalities. Clearly, uh, the, the benefits of not having to worry about the coagulation, the epidural hematomas, that sort of thing for uh, ESP are gonna be a lot better than for your thoracic epidurals and the complications that can go along with that. So let's get into a little bit about how we actually scan this block. I'm gonna show you two different techniques, but the one that's widely used is this one where you start on that, uh, right at the spinous process. So that's gonna be that blue box in the bottom left-hand corner. And, and then you just slowly scan laterally. Now, as you slowly scan laterally, uh, what you'll see is first the lamina, and I'll see, let's see if we can see my, my arrow here. I don't know if you can see my arrow on this. No, you can't see my arrow. That's okay. Actually, you know what? You will hear in just a second. Let me, I'm gonna do a little laser pointer. Okay, so um, here's the spinous process here. And then this is gonna be the lamina. And the lamina almost looks like a sawtooth pattern. And I'll show you that when I, when I scan uh, today, but it's, it's usually pretty deep because the lamina kind of comes deeper. And then the uh, transverse processes are a little bit more superficial, which is gonna be this red line here. And then as you go more lateral to that, you're gonna be on, uh, on the ribs. Now there's some characteristic little features that are on ultrasound for these differences. One is the transverse processes typically look a little bit more boxy. And you can kind of appreciate that a little bit here where they're pretty flat. So transverse processes are generally pretty flat, whereas the ribs are round. They generally have a more roundish appearance to them. Uh, the other aspect is, is when you're scanning transverse process, there will be the absence of the lungs. Obviously, we don't want to see the lungs. Here, you can see the pleura down here. Sometimes you can see a little bit of pleura, but generally, I don't see it a whole lot. Um, you see it very more prominently when you're scanning and you're over the ribs. Also, I'll show you there's a way you can see that transition point between transverse process and ribs. As you slowly scan laterally, there's a shifting that goes on between transverse process and ribs. 
The second way um, I'll show you how to scan is, is not uh, doing your probe longitudinally this way, uh, but you actually go the other way. You go uh, sagittally, okay? And that way you can actually see both the transverse process and the spinous process and the rib all in one view. And I'll show you what that looks like characteristically on the ultrasound when we, when we go to scanning. There's several different positions that we can use. This is the typical standard position we use, at, you know, just with a patient sitting, doing it with them awake. Obviously, if you're doing it before surgery, this is ideal. You want you can do it right before, you know, in the OR if you want to, right before you, you lay them down to induce them for anesthesia. And you can go in there and inject your 20 cc's of local anesthesia. Some people like to put catheters in there. Other people like to put long-acting local anesthetics, such as uh, liposomal bupivacaine in there, um, all of which you can do uh, and we've done in the past. The other way you can do it is you can have them uh, laying down, as you can see in this image on the right. Um, they're, in this view, they're kind of going over the patient. Um, I kind of like to, if they're lateral, I'll, I kind of like to stand on the side that, that they are rather than reaching over it. Or some people like to do this when they're completely prone. Um, so that's also a way of doing that. So here is an uh, ultrasound image of that. So you can see the needle goes down and you can see this nice boxy shape of the transverse process. And the needle will go down there and tap the transverse process. And the key is, is you want the local anesthetic to go underneath the muscle, not into the muscle. And sometimes that fascia layer that's covering the top of the transverse process can be a little um, challenging to pop through. Uh, even when you feel you're on bone, sometimes you're actually pushing the fascia onto the bone and you're not through the fascia. So sometimes, I'll show you a video here in a minute of what I mean, but sometimes I have to go a little bit over the rib or maybe, or a transverse process rather, or maybe come at it at this angle. So I pierce through that fascia before I go in there. Now, let me, let me show you a video of that. Now in this video, you'll actually see them with their first injection, they'll uh, actually inject intramuscularly. And I'll show you what that looks like. So here, this is actually rhomboid right here. Trapezius is above there. And this is the uh, uh, spinous, um, uh, erector spiny muscles here, transverse process. So see that local anesthetic there? That was actually intramuscularly. So they, they're kind of go, taking an approach where they're going above the, uh, there you go, that's, that's really good there. They're going above the transverse process and then see how it just kind of lifts off. There's kind of that black line right there of local anesthetic. And then when they stop injecting, it will compress down. Um, and if you see that happening when you're doing your, your block, you know you're in the right spot. If you're intramuscularly, it doesn't collapse. It will just stay there. Um, and so that's kind of a telltale sign to know if you're in the right spot is if you see it kind of um, expanding um, and then when you stop injecting it, it contracts again. Okay, that's, that's one way um, that we can uh, tell about that. So what we're gonna do is I'm actually gonna go, let, we're, um, I'll go over PEX block real quick and then we'll, we'll go to scanning. So, so the modified PEX block, I'm, I'm just gonna show you slides of how to get to a regular uh, classic PEX block and then I'll kind of explain some of the differences here. This is a lot of verbiage kind of explaining how I do it, but I talk a lot about home base when I, when I talk about my blocks. Uh, like uh, I, last month, we talked about the quadratus lumborum block and that home base was doing a tap block. Well, so that you don't get lost and you can count the ribs appropriately, I always call home base for a pex block, looking at the intraclavicular block, finding the arteries just underneath the clavicle, because it's really easy to find the second rib from that, uh, from that location. And then it just becomes a counting game. Then you can just count the second rib, third rib, fourth rib, if you need to go down to the fourth rib. Um, and I'll show you some techniques. You can kind of angle your probe a little medially, like you're kind of angling it towards the, the, the sternum a little bit. That usually can help make the ribs look a little, uh, a little nicer. Um, now for cardiac, what I do is uh, when you're in the midclavicular line, you'll actually see, let me go to this next uh, image. When you're at midclavicular line, you'll see the pec minor underneath the pec major here, okay? Now this is my Spanish version of this. You have pectoral mayor <laughs> and pectoral menor. So this is encerato, that's all Spanish, but you know, just know those, those are, these, these are the right muscles here, okay? 
So underneath the pec major muscle is the pec minor muscle when you're in midclavicular line. Now, what I use for uh, cardiac is I just go medial to where I don't see the pec minor muscle anymore. And that's kind of where I start or do my injection. Um, so I've done this several different ways. I've done this where I've done a classic pex block. I've done this where I've done a parasternal block. And then we found that doing it this way has, has done several things for us. So what are the pitfalls of doing the other one? So let's talk about regular pecs block for cardiac. So for cardiac, obviously we're doing a sternotomy, which is coming all the way down from here, all the way down to the xiphoid, okay? The manubrium all the way down to the xiphoid. Well, I found that if I'm a little lateral, some of the times I don't get all the spread that I need to uh, around the, the sternum and, and, and I missed it. So we, we did probably 10 cases. We were just doing classic pex blocks and probably about 30 to 40% of them, they, they had some pretty good sternal chest pain despite doing a really good pex one and pex two block. Well, then we moved to doing this parasternal technique where we injected just parasternally, just right at the lit ribs and, and uh, just, just lateral to the sternum. Well, uh, we didn't get very far because most of our blocks will do when, when we're uh, right after induction. And there was a couple instances, we, we had two instances in a row actually, where the surgeon after making the sternotomy, he actually saw the local anesthetic in the field. And so it wasn't very effective at that point because he sucked it all out when he did his sternotomy. So I said, well, what's a really good way that we can, you know, not have that problem? And, and a good uh, sono anatomy uh, landmark is the border of the pec minor and going right there. So you're a little bit more medial than a classic pec block, but you're lateral than a, uh, than a uh, parasternal block. And then in addition, what I do is I'll inject uh, both at the third rib, which is here, and the fourth rib, which is here, to get pretty good spread. And that has kind of been the winning number for getting good uh, reliable uh, sternal analgesia. Uh, and, and we've done a lot of experimenting with this. We've done it where we've just gone to the third rib, we've injected 20 cc's there, we've done 30 cc's, we've, um, we've done it all at fourth rib, but I've found that reliably getting the whole uh, sternotomy doing the third and the fourth rib has been very effective and most of these patients do extremely well. So well, in fact, that the largest decrease in opioid utilization has been the cardiac patients at our hospital. So they now average one tramadol a day, and that's the average. So that means a lot of these patients don't take any narcotics. They don't take anything because they simply don't need it. Um, so that's been kind of the biggest win for our hospital has been this, uh, this block specifically. In addition, um, I'm not gonna go into this right now, but uh, what we found is just doing this wasn't enough because a lot of these patients were having a lot of pain subxiphoid from the chest tube. So right here, subxiphoid or subcostal, these patients were having pain from the chest tubes that were sticking out underneath them. So we would combine this with a subcostal block, just doing a small amount of local anesthetic there uh, would help helped out tremendously for that. So the volumes I use are 10 cc's on, on each of these ribs. So 10 cc's of local anesthetic on the third rib, 10 cc's on the fourth rib, and then I'll do 10 cc's on each side for a, um, for a subcostal, or, uh, 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 yeah, subcostal tap block. That's how I would do it. Now the classic tap block looks similar to this, where you, uh, you, a pec two block is right on top of the rib, or depending on if you're lateral enough, you can actually see the serratus anterior muscle, which you can actually appreciate here. You have to be pretty lateral to appreciate the serratus anterior muscle, um, where they're putting it in between there. Uh, if you're at the uh, midclavicular line or slightly lateral to that, generally you will not appreciate the serratus anterior muscle. And if that's the case, what you would do is you just go down and tap the rib and put your local anesthetic there instead of on top of a muscle such as the serratus anterior muscle because it's not gonna be there. And then, uh, and then you slowly back out and I put local anesthetic between the pec minor and pec major, which is a pec one block, which is this one, which is putting local anesthetic right there. 
So this is kind of what it looks like when you're doing uh, home base. This is an infraclavicular block. So you look, you're about mid clavicular line here. You can see the arteries. You can see the pec minor, pec major muscles right there. Now, if you do a little medial tilt with this probe, basically you're tilting it towards kind of the sternum. All of a sudden, you'll see the second rib kind of pop up. And then from there, you can scan down. So from here, you can scan down. This is clearly a little bit more lateral because I can see a little bit of serratus anterior muscle here. And then here is the pec minor muscle. And here's the pec major muscle on top of that. Here's another image of that where you can see this is just a very, very small amount of serratus anterior muscle here. Okay, here's our rib right there. And then you can see pec minor and pec major. Now remember, when we're doing this for cardiac, I'll get to this view initially, but then I'll just slide my probe medially until this muscle disappears and kind of goes away, okay? So I'm gonna leave you with this thought just to keep calm and do a regional anesthetic because it is the wave of the future. So uh, with that, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna move over uh, to, to our live model here and we're gonna do some scanning. So I'm gonna scan for um, erector spiny first. I'm gonna kind of show you how, how I do that, these different views and, and angles that we do for that. And then, um, and then I'll, uh, we'll scan the pec block as well, okay? So for cardiac, it's pretty simple because here I can just use the base of the scapula as my landmark. And really all I wanna do is uh, inject either T4 or T5. So I can just use the base of the scapula and just go just slightly above that, okay? So let's see here. I'm going to go, so just so you know what's superior and inferior. So the, the left of the screen is going to be cephalad and, and the right of the screen is going to be caudad. Okay, so I'm just going to kind of go right here in the middle of the screen. And then this is, that's actually my uh, spinous process right there. Um, sometimes it's pretty hard to see because it's a very narrow structure looking this way. And as I go lateral, this down here at the bottom, I'm going to move this arrow here. This down here at the bottom, this is the lamina of the, um, of the spine. And you see it's almost one continuous white line. It almost looks kind of like a sawtooth pattern. As I go a little bit more, it looks even a little bit more sawtooth. Uh, it kind of looks like the sawtooth pattern. Now, as I go more lateral, see these structures kind of starting to jet up? That is the transverse process. And it's pretty flat on the top here, although it kind of looks a little round. But when I go even more lateral, look, see how they disappear? And then this other structure appears here. So this is actually rib. I'm a little bit more lateral here. Now I'm gonna go back medial and notice what happens. I'm gonna go medial, 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 and then see that shift and then boom, this comes back up here again. Um, I can see a little bit of pleura down here. I told you earlier, you can't see it, but usually, um, you know, if you have a thicker patient, usually it's, it's really deep like this, but when I go more lateral to the rib, look how much more superficial the pleura is here. So this is, this is rib here, and it looks a lot more round. It's a little bit more rounded of a structure. I'm gonna go medial again, and boom, that is the transverse process. It's a little bit more flat on top. Now, it's really important that you hit the transverse process. Now, I have, inadvertently on many occasions, well, I want to say many occasions, on, on, on certain occasions, I've accidentally hit the rib. Now, what happens if you do that? What happens if you hit the rib and you miss the transverse process? Well, there's a little ligament here, and I'm actually going to show you that by doing the other technique to help find this. So sometimes people have a, a hard time appreciating this or appreciating which one is which. So one of the things you can do is you can do a sagittal approach, and I'll show you this here in a second. So here's sagittal. Um, and so if you look at my probe, I just rotated it 90 degrees. Now this right here, this structure right here, that is my spinous process. This is my lamina. I'm just going to kind of scan up and down a little bit. Now this, oh, this is perfect right here. So this is the lamina right here. And then this little bulb that's coming up here, that's my transverse process. Now see, there's a little nick right here almost looks like a little nick, and then this goes up. This is the rib. I'm gonna go scan a little bit lateral here. So here on the left side of the screen, you can appreciate this is a transverse, or a spinous process, kind of comes down here into the lamina, comes up to the transverse process, and then there's this little nick here as the rib comes up out from underneath 
the transverse process. Now, what I was explaining earlier is if you hit the rib and not get on the transverse process, the local anesthetic is trapped there. It will only spread laterally around the rib, okay? Versus if I'm on the transverse process, the local anesthetic will come medially and down into the pervertebral space. So what that means is your block just won't be as effective, all right? Part of the efficacy of this block is the fact that you are very close to the pervertebral space. If you get too lateral, this local anesthetic will hang out and just get the uh, terminal branches of the uh, of the, uh, the, of the of the costal um, nerves, uh, and won't get around the paratribal space because it pretty much will stop right here at this nick where this ligament is. Okay, um, so with this view, if you get lost, it's really easy to identify. Now I can say, okay, this here is my transverse process. So if you have an ultrasound machine that has a center line, I can, I can put a little center line there and then I can just use my probe. I can just rotate it again, 190 degrees, just keeping that in the center. And now I know that that is my transverse process. And then I can still go with my needle cephalad to caudad. And actually I have a chopstick I can kind of show you. So this is kind of the way I would go with my needle is I just go cephalad to caudad with my needle. Now, if I go a little bit more lateral, again, you see that transition point as you see the um, um, the rib pop up in the view. Whoops, let me go back here. Okay, good. So just last time, I'm going to kind of show you this. I'm going to scan this one more time. So this is, um, this is doing a longitudinal view. So I'm starting right at the midline. So this is going to be my spinous process. As I scan lateral, you can start seeing this nice white continuous structure, which is the lamina. And then more superficially, you'll start seeing to rise up, you'll see these, uh, the transverse process, okay? Now, as you see the transverse process, uh, if you go too lateral and you go too fast, then all of a sudden you'll be in rib, okay? And you'll see a lot of pleura right here, okay? And look how much more rounded this looks. If I go back medial, you see that transition point, a lot more flat, very difficult to see pleura way down here. I can still see it because I'm, I'm scanning that deep, but, um, but a little bit more difficult. It's kind of one of the telltales for it being in the transverse process. Again, it's harder to see the pleura than when you're at the rib. Um, and again, a little bit more boxy, okay? So again, I'm just gonna go cephalad to caudad with my needle, and I'm gonna go down and tap the top of the transverse process right here and the key is I wanna be underneath the fascia. And when I do my local anesthetic um, infiltration, I'm just gonna see the local anesthetic, the hypoechoicity of the local anesthetic raise up the muscle. And usually again, when I stop uh, my injection, then it will kind of collapse again, okay? Now again, I see a lot of people doing this technique uh, throughout the country with great success. And it's been, uh, and it's a great block. It does, it does a good job for, um, for treating uh, pain, parasternal pain, and even the subxiphoid pain from uh, chest tubes. Um, the, um, um, the only pitfall I have found with it is, uh, just in my clinical practice, is workflow issues. So workflow has been, you know, I have to have the patient awake. I have to have them sitting up like this. And then I do the do the injection, and then I lay them down, and then I induce them, and uh, and that can be uh, that's a workflow issue for 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 us. Now um, we have a anesthetic team, an acute pain service that will do the blocks for us, and so we can parallel process a lot when we're doing our blocks. Where while the cardiac team is inducing the patient, the acute pain service team can be doing. PEX blocks or these modified PEX blocks. So that's why we, uh, we like to do these modified PEX blocks um, more than these ESP blocks. It's not because they are, um, they are uh, better, it's just the workflow has been better. And there's a question, so let's see what it is. What was the question? Okay, so we use, we use liposomal bupivacaine because we found that it's lasted longer for us. And so I mix a concentration of uh, 20 cc's of 
liposomal bupivacaine, uh, and I mix that with 40 cc's of quarter percent bupivacaine. So that makes a total of 60, and then it's three, three, and three. So third rib, fourth rib, subcostal. So it's pretty much 30 cc's on each side. And that's been the concentration we've used, and it's worked really well for us because of um, the, uh, um, the how, how long it lasts. Okay, so I just saw that question. So again, if you have questions on these, you can type type them in, and uh, and then I'll I'll get to them and I'll ask them or answer them. Okay, and we're actually going to have a good amount of time to go over questions um, at the end. I'm going to save uh, 15 minutes at the end to go over any questions you guys have. All right. So with that, what we're going to do is we're going to move to PEX blocks here, and I'll kind of show you uh, that. I'm going to change my settings here just a little bit. Great. Okay. So I'll show you kind of what I do for home base. And um, let's see here. So, all right, so the left of your screen is gonna be cephalad and the right of your screen is gonna be cauda. So if I am at the mid clavicular line, okay, right under the clavicle, boom, right there, you can see, let's see here. Okay, you can see my vessels. Here, here's, my, here's my vessels right here, okay. And then this is gonna be your pec major right here. And this is your pec minor. Now she's, she's really skinny. And so I don't really have to do a lot of adjustment, but this is actually my second rib right here. Usually if you do a slight medial tilt, now if you look at my camera, if I do a slight medial tilt, a lot of times you can actually appreciate it a little bit more superficially. So there, there's the medial tilt, there's without it. See, without it, it, it kind of hides way down here. A lot of times people can appreciate it. But if you do a medial tilt, like that, you'll really appreciate that second rib, okay? And then it's just a counting game. So there's second rib, and then you go down to third rib, okay, whoops. You can go down to third rib right there. Now, this is this is really great. So if you're doing like a mastectomy or, um, or, or implant or whatever, um, this is where you could go. You go down to third rib, tap the top, tap the top of the third rib, which is gonna be your PEX2 block, and then back up slightly here, to see, uh, to get in between the pec major muscle here and the pec minor muscle here. So this is where I would go for a pecs one block. For pecs two block, I wanna go here. Now notice I don't really appreciate uh, any serratus anterior muscle. Maybe this right here, very small amount of fascia is most likely the connective tissue of the serratus anterior. And if I go a little bit more lateral, yeah, now I can really appreciate it. So this actually right here is actually serratus. Very thin, very small amount of serratus tissue, but that's again more lateral. Now notice what else happens when you go more lateral. The more lateral you go, the thicker your pec minor muscle is, okay? Now when the more medial you go, look how thin it is. Now I've only gone, probably traversed about a centimeter and a half. It is not a huge amount of distance, okay? so. For the sake of argument, this is gonna be, I go medial here, notice what I don't see now. Now I don't see the pec minor at all. All I see here is my pec major on top of the rib. So this is gonna be my fourth rib right here. And this is my third rib right here. So when I do this block, this modified pecs block for cardiac, what, I, what I'm gonna do now, let me, I'm gonna try something here. Um, Freeze. Okay, I'm going to freeze this here, and I'm going to see if I can still use my arrow. Oh, I can. Great. Oh, this is this is awesome. All right. So, so I'm going to kind of explain this a little bit. This is the ideal view you want to have when you're doing a modified pex block. I want to try to see both the fourth rib and the third rib in the same uh, plane, in the same view here. And when I come in and do it, I try to put my needle a little bit more cephalad uh, about, by about two centimeters than where the probe is, okay? And then I'll um, come down and I'll usually come to the fourth rib first. Um, try doing the fourth rib first because you, your needle trajectory will be a lot more, a lot straighter, okay? So imagine, I'm here in front of the camera. Um, oh, there we go. So. If I go down to the third rib, I'm going to take a sharper angle to go down to it because it's going to be a lot more proximal. Okay, my fourth rib is going to be over here, so I can take a a, a slightly more uh, a, uh, less of an acute angle. 
Um, and it's usually harder to do when you get to the fourth rib at, to do that angle that's really flat. So if you back up from your probe about two centimeters and you go in, um, you'll find it's gonna be a lot easier to do. So what I do is I'll go down, tap the fourth rib, do my local infiltration there, and then I'll back up and then I'll go dive down and hit the top of the third rib. So just in the, like in this view here. So let's go back to this view here. So in this view here, uh, I'll come down here. I usually tap the top of the fourth rib. And one of the key things you want to find or see when you're doing your injection is you want to see the local anesthetic going over the top of the rib and trying and going and going uh, caught at. Okay. Same thing when you're doing the third rib. You want to see the local anesthetic kind of going a caught at. Now, when you do the injection, it looks very similar to the injection we did on the um, ESP block where the, the muscle will just kind of raise up from the, uh, from the rib. And as soon as you stop injecting, boom, it will collapse down again. Um, that's very typical for doing this modified PEX block. So that's again, another key uh, feature you can look for to show that you're not intramuscular. Because if you're intramuscular, then um, it's just gonna stay there. It's gonna hang out there. Now, I always say to go down and tap the rib. That's very important to do, but just know that uh, you just need to tap it. I had a colleague once who I uh, was teaching them how to do this. They were really excited about it. They went down and they tapped the rib and I started injecting, but I wasn't able to inject. I said, well, you're probably on the fascia, back up a little bit, back up a little bit, still couldn't inject, still couldn't inject. He backed up all the way out of the, out of the uh, skin and we looked and there was a little piece of bone sticking out of the tip of the needle. So he'd caused a, he, he'd done a bone biopsy basically. So, um, so just go down and tap the rib, especially these older individuals they're they, uh, they, they're a little bit more frail and cartilaginous. I think we have another question. Yes. The question on the chat portal, have you used continuous catheter cut for erector spinae block for cardiac surgery? When would you use modified PEC versus erector spinae for cardiac Surgery. Yeah, so so the question for this was, have I used catheter techniques for for cardiac surgery doing erector spinae, um, and when would I use that versus doing a modified PEC block? So the answer to the question is yes, I have used catheter technique for cardiac surgery, um, and they work great. Um, you can get good longevity uh, with them. Obviously, with a catheter, they can stay in there for three, four, or five days if they need to. Uh, but again, you're doing both sides. So you're doing two different catheters, which you, which you can do. Um, but uh, we don't typically do them at our hospital because of, um, as I mentioned, workflow. So some people are really comfortable doing erector spiny blocks. And if that's the case, great. Just keep doing them because they do work as we show that they, they, they show that they work and they're very uh, efficacious. I don't know that there's a study out there comparing PEX block to rector spiny block specifically for cardiac surgery and which one is better um, because the, I mean, they're both, they're both great. They both work really well. Some, one might work better for you from a workflow standpoint. Um, you know, there's also doing the modified PEC block technique with a catheter, which we've actually done before as well. Now we have to do that at the end of the procedure before, um, uh, before we uh, take them up to the ICU or, 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 or um, emerge them from anesthesia. But, you know, you can also do that as well. You can also do a, a catheter technique for that as well. Okay. I'm trying to remember, there was one other thing I was going to say about uh, PEX blocks. Um, so yeah, if you get lost with a PEX block, just go back to home base, go back and find the infraclavicular spot uh, right in the mid clavicular line. And then you can just do a little medial tilt with the pro. You can see that, that rib pop right up. Okay, that's always going to be your second rib. From there, it's just a counting game. Then you just go down to the third rib, fourth rib, and then you can just scan a little bit medially until you see, or until you don't see the pec minor. When the pec minor kind of dives away or goes away, that's a really good landmark to know, okay, I've gone medial enough to do it, but not too medial to where my local anesthetic is now going to go into the surgical field. Because if it goes into the surgical field and the surgeon's like, wait, what is all this? You know, suck it, you know, they suction it out and then it's not very effective. And then they're like, well, don't do these blocks anymore, <laughs> you know, because I don't want, I don't want you to mess up my surgical field. You know, we all know the arguments that the surgeons make, but, um, but yeah, so th that's, um, 
That's the technique that we currently do at our hospital. But again, we have used erector spiny techniques, which are great. Um, so for us, it's not a, this one is better than this one. It's just for us, the workflow is better for us to do a modified PEX block technique, but you can do catheter techniques or ESP and they work well as well also. Now, I think we had some more questions. Do we have any more questions? I don't have any. No other questions. Okay, well, if you guys have any other questions, we can certainly entertain them right now. Um, talking about, we have four more minutes. We have, we have a couple more minutes to go to go over any questions you guys might have uh, related to these, these different types of blocks. So I uh, want to thank our live model. She was awesome. Thank you very much. This is, this is really fun. Um, and then, um, yeah, if you have questions, one of the things you can do, you can always submit them to, uh, to uh, Sonosai Fujifilm and they can send them to us. Yeah, and I think we had a question. Go ahead. Are you concerned about uh, hepardization for erector spinae block at emergence? At emergence? Or at, at emergence. Oh, okay. That's actually a great question, which we didn't talk about. Uh, we kind of lightly talked about it for obviously uh, thoracic epidurals. So obviously there's reasons why we don't want to do thoracic epidurals in highly heparinized patients. But interestingly enough for uh, ESP blocks, um, the 2018 ASRA guidelines really helped highlight a lot of the uh, coagulopathy um, concerns that we should have for different blocks. And the biggest one is, uh, can we put pressure on it? And if we, and is it gonna cause, uh, if a hematoma does develop, is that gonna cause a major problem? So if we look at ESP block in those regards, now, can we put pressure on it? Yeah, sure. But usually you're, the patient's already putting pressure on it if they do get a hematoma anyway, because they're laying on their back, right? Uh, the other one is, is if a hematoma does develop, is it really gonna be a problem? And for ESP block, it's probably not because, um, because that hematoma is gonna develop between the transverse process and the erector spining muscles uh, versus in the epidural space, which is a very tight enclosed bony structure uh, space that can cause obviously a lot of problems. That's why we don't like to do uh, thoracic epidurals for that very reason. But for ESP, uh, no. And so we have done ESP blocks uh, a lot for heparinized patients, also patients on Plavix, Eliquis, all the um, people who are on Coumadin, you can do ESP blocks for them. Um, based on those new ASRA guidelines, it's really helped highlight this as a, as a safety issue. So, um, so no, I'm not concerned at all for doing them for uh, heparinized patients. That was an excellent question. I'm glad you brought that up. Was there another, was there another one? Yeah, Dr. Teams, yeah. we have one more. Uh, yeah. It's actually a multi-question question. question. Um, <laughs> oh, those, are my, those are the best kind. I hope, I, hope there's, I hope there's betting going on just like the last video. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> there's right. there a bet that was going on. Mm -hmm. I want to, let's see. Okay, go okay. ahead. Uh, any tips for starting out doing ESP blocks, rib block, um, both those questions. And then also, where exactly do you place the block subsiphoid for the chest tube? Okay, so... So the first question was just starting out doing ESP, a good good way to do it. Yeah. So, yeah. So if you're just starting out doing ESP, um, I mean, the best way to get good at something is to do it. Um, and it's it, it's it's not a challenging block, right? So what we're really focusing on for ESP is we're looking at the bony structures. And so starting at the spinous process, which you may not see, but as you move off the spinous process, you see that nice white structure of the lamina and they keep going lateral, just go real slow. What I see a lot of people doing is they're like, okay, there's this and they, they literally move their probe this fast. You don't, you shouldn't do that. If you're starting off, you, and I even do this, I don't, I don't go that fast. I start here at the, at the midline, right at the spinous process. And I'm literally going at a snail's pace. And then when I'm, when I think I'm there, I go back and I scan and then I go more lateral to verify, yeah, that's the rib. And if I still have questions about it, cause sometimes if you get these bigger patients, I'm like, gosh, I don't know. Is that rib, is that transverse process? Then what I'll do is I'll do the sagittal approach where I'll go this way and I'll be like, okay, yeah, I see that nick between the transverse process and the rib. And now I know that's transverse process. So I'll take it, I'll move it right over to the transverse process and then I'll rotate 
90 degrees. And then I'm like, okay, I like it there. And then the other, key, the other thing that's helped me out, uh, especially with educating other people is get a marking pen. And when you get that level, uh, mark it, mark the skin, mark the outline of the probe, because how many times have we found the perfect image that we want to block and then we look away to grab our needle or we grab something else or, you know, tell the surgeon to shut up. Don't bother me. I'm doing a block, whatever. And then we come back and then we can't, and we can't find our, our block. It's gone. Right. But if you mark it out, then you're like, okay, bam, there it is again. So that's been tremendously helpful for people learning how to do these so that, so they get it and they can be a little bit more facile with it. Now the, um, the other question was, um, oh, for, for some xiphoid. Well, I can show you real quick. I can scan it real quick. We have time. We have time, right? Yes, we have time. Yeah. We have all kinds of time. It'd just be your belly. Yeah. Um, so, for, so what we would do here, let me uh, unfreeze this. Okay. So what we would do here, it, oh, this is perfect. So I just go sub xiphoid, okay? And as I just move a tiny bit lateral, what I'm looking for is I'm looking for the rectus muscle and the transversalis abdominis muscle, okay? So where those are is right here. So this all up here is the rectus muscle, and this little wedge right here is the transversalis abdominis muscle, okay? So the cool thing about this block is I can, oh, where did my, uh, I need my, my pointing wand. <laughs> so this is my needle, expelliarmus. All right, so I can either go, I can either go from medial to lateral or uh, yeah, or lateral to medial, or I can go medial to lateral. It doesn't matter. So when I do this block, I usually stand on one side of the patient and I do it here and then I go over to the other side and then I can do it here. This is another great image here. You can see the rectus muscle on top and then down below, you can see the transversalis abdominis muscle here. So where I'm going is right in between. I'm just putting my local anesthetic right in between the transversalis abdominis muscle and the rectus muscle. Now notice how my, how my probe is oriented. My probe is oriented where I'm abutting the costal margin and the costal margin is at an angle, okay? It's not, it's not completely sagittal like this, it's at an angle. And another thing you can do is you can do what I, sometimes depending on your patient's body habitus, it may be a little bit more challenging to see the transversalis abdominis muscle. So you can do what I call the costal peak. And a costal peak is basically, I rotate my, my probe and I'm like trying to peek underneath the ribs. And look what happened there. When I did that, the transversalis abdominis muscle, which is right here where my arrow is, is a lot bigger. If I'm straight up and down, look how small it gets, it almost disappears. So you kind of need to do a slight what I call costal peak in order to really visualize that. So here I can really see, I can see that transversalis abdominis muscle. And again, I can just go me medial to lateral with my needle, just like this, um, and, and go down there and inject my local anesthetic there. And that will get the dermatomes that are right there where those chest tubes come out sub xiphoid. And it pretty much gets everything sub xiphoid all the way down to about um, T8, T9 area but usually you don't even need to go that far down. Did that answer your questions? Hopefully that, hopefully that did. What, was there any other, were there any other questions about that or follow-up questions to that? I know that's, it was kind of a quick one. I didn't have slides about that, but that's, that's a really great question um, for getting those, uh, that dermatome where the uh, costal margin is. Just remember, just remember you need to, you need to be up a, right at the costal margin let me make sure I can, I can see it right. You need to be right at the costal margin and you're need, you need to be at an angle, okay? You're not gonna be completely sagittal. You're gonna be at an angle because the costal margin is at an angle like this. So you need to be, you need to be kind of at an angle uh, right, up, right up to the costal margin when you do it. And then again, you can go medial to lateral or you can go lateral to medial with your needle. It doesn't matter. The, the, what matters is, is the location of the local anesthetic and the tissue plane which should be between the um, rectus muscle and the transversalis abdominis muscle, okay? So that was a really great question. Yes, and they said that you answered it beautifully. Thank you. Um, oh, good. Do you have another question? How long do you see the modified PEX blocks using last using your combo of 
bupivacaine, and regular bup, bup, yeah, bupivacaine, sorry. <laughs> I know it's kind of a mouthful. Yeah, so, um, so I'll see about two to two and a half days of good analgesia. And we, we actually have really good data about that at our hospital because every patient who does get liposomal bupivacaine, we do follow them for two days, okay? If we just gave them plain ropivacaine, then we only follow them for one day. And, and, and that's pretty consistent, right? So if I use just plain ropivacaine, you know, generally I'll get maybe 18, maybe 24 hours at the max uh, with it. Usually between 12 and 24 hours is kind of the tail end of that. But with liposomal bupivacaine for this modified technique, uh, I get a, between two to two and a half days out of it with an average probably being about two days um, analgesia. And so, and that's, that's usually plenty enough to get the patients obviously extubated, which is the most important uh, aspect, you know, post uh, cabbage or heart case or whatever is getting them extubated. And then um, also facilitating pain for the for eventual chest tube removal. Because once the chest tubes are removed, usually they don't have as much pain after that. So, so that's kind of been, that's kind of been uh, really great for us um, as far as the, the, the duration of it. So very good question. Okay, and one last question. Um, how much local anesthetic for this block? For the modified PEC or for the ESP? Well, they didn't say, so I'm, I'm assuming for the modified PEC. Well, just, okay, I'll just answer for both. So for okay. ESP, I'll do 20 to 30 cc's um, uh, on each side. Uh, so, you know, for ESP, you need to do both sides. Same thing for, um, for modified PEC, you got to do both sides. Uh, and so I'll do a total of 30 cc's of local anesthetic per side. So what that is, is 10 cc's for the third rib, 10 cc's for the fourth rib, and then 10 cc's for that subcostal, all right? Uh, if I am using uh, liposomal bupivacaine, I will, I, I won't inject it immediately, just right off the bat. I always have uh, 10 cc's of saline loaded onto it uh, because it can look just like your tissue planes. And so I want to use that, um, that uh, saline, that hypoechoicity of saline to verify that I'm in the right tissue plane. Because again, remember, sometimes it, just because I'm on the bone doesn't mean I'm under the fascia. And so I want to make sure I'm under the fascia and I don't want it to be disturbed with the, um, the, how li the, the lipid of uh, liposomal bupivacaine. I don't want that to interfere with my view. So I'll, I'll load it with a 10 cc's of saline. Mm -hmm. So, and I'll just give, you know, three, four, five, sometimes I've had to get a 10 cc's of saline, which isn't a problem, just to make sure that I am in the right tissue plane. I see it lifting up and then I'll add the liposomal bupivacaine after that. So again, 30 cc's each side, so a total of 60 cc's of uh, local anesthetic. And how that's broken down is 20 cc's of uh, liposomal bupivacaine and 40 cc's of quarter percent bupivacaine. That's how it's broken down. So 20 and 40. Okay. Uh, and then that gives me a total of 60, and then I can do 30 on each side. Now, if I was doing it for ESP, um, you know, if I'm doing a catheter, then I'd probably do 20 cc's of ropivacaine and then put my catheter in. If I'm doing it with liposomal bupivacaine, I'd probably do 30 cc's on each side as well. So that'd be a total of 60 cc's as well for the one, for the one location. Great. That is all of our questions and we are actually at time, but uh, I, I really appreciate such a detailed webinar. You did fantastic. That was, that was really incredible. Um, Thank you. So thank you everyone for joining us today. And if you want to see any of our other webinars, they will be posted on our website. Uh, Daniel, can you go to that last slide by any chance? Oh, I can do it. Here we go. One more Maybe. slide. Just thinking about it. Sorry. There, there we go. go. Okay, so this website right here shows uh, it'll be, there'll be a recording of this presentation and also all of our past webinars and future webinars. So feel free to check out future topics. And uh, if you wanna see a recording of this webinar, it will be posted there in about a day or two. I thank you all for joining us today. This was a great webinar and uh, we'll see you again soon. Thanks. <laughs>